Welcome. It's so good that you could join us today for our online worship here at Faith Lutheran Church, Grand Blanc. I'm Pastor Bob Scott, for those of you who do not know me. Uh, and I, thinking of all of those uh, who might be watching uh, this service for the first time today, maybe you've been away uh, from the church for a little bit, a little while. Maybe you're just joining us uh, because you're part of another congregation that does not yet offer online worship, whatever the reason. We're so grateful that uh, you're with us today. And especially those who do not yet have a church home, we, we do pray that uh, when we are able to return to regular live worship here at Faith, that, that you would join us uh, here in person as well so that, that I can uh, meet you in person. Uh, whatever the reason, we're glad that you could join us today. Uh, today, we will be remembering and celebrating uh, the ascension of our Lord, that event that happened 40 days after his resurrection when our Lord Jesus uh, returned to his heavenly Father. So all of our readings uh, in worship today are kind of focused on that one event. And we especially rejoice in that uh, we have forgiveness and peace with our Heavenly Father because Jesus came, suffered, and died for us and rose again and now sits at the right hand of his Father in heaven. And so uh, we come together to receive his gifts, that peace that he gives us, and extend it to one another as well. So I invite you now, uh, as I extend that peace to you, to extend it with those around you, uh, those family who are nearby, give them a hug or a handshake. And, and then I even invite you to maybe pause the worship for a minute, minute and text uh, those loved ones or someone you might be thinking of and text them uh, the Lord's peace as well. The peace of the Lord be with you always. As we continue now, uh, we sing our opening hymn together, a hymn of glory, let us sing, sing, which is number 493 in the hymnal. of glory let us sing new hymns throughout the world shall ring alleluia alleluia christ by a road before untrod ascends unto the throne of god alleluia alleluia Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Be now our joy, our earth, O oh Lord, and be our future great reward. Alleluia, Alleluia. Then Throned with you forever, we shall praise your name eternally. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. I invite you now to stand as we begin our worship with the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I, amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. He brings us light that shines in our darkness. He brings us life that death cannot overcome. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Alleluia, Christ is risen. 
He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. In repentant faith, we come before our Lord in confession. Almighty God, merciful Father, we are by nature sinful and separated from you and thus confess our sinfulness. We have sinned by thinking only of ourselves, not others, by saying words that hurt, not heal, in our actions that do not show love, but indifference. We have often not resisted the devil as we have often failed to live in the oneness you give. Forgive us for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus, our Lord. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. You are the King of glory, O Christ. You are the everlasting Son of the Father, now seated at his right hand. As you send the Holy Spirit to us through your word and sacraments, Give us the strengthening of faith to endure all trials and live in the hope of eternal life. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated now uh, as we turn to our scripture readings for today. Our first lesson is from Acts chapter 1, beginning at the 12th verse. And here we find the disciples gathered in Jerusalem, devoting themselves to prayer. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all of his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, al which is field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward too Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson, uh, we also hear from First Peter, from Peter in First Peter, beginning uh, chapter four at the twelfth verse. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand now for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you now to join me as we confess our common faith together and show our unity in Christ in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated now and join me in the hymn of the day, Look Ye Saints, the Sight is Glorious, which is number 495 in your hymnal. Look ye saints, the sight is glorious, see the man of sorrows now. From the fight return victorious, every knee to him shall bow. Crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him. Comes the victor's brow. Crowns become the victor's brow. Hark those bursts of acclamation. Hark those loud triumphant chords. Jesus takes the highest station. Oh, what joy the sight affords. Crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him, King of kings and Lord of lords, King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, I invite all of the children now to gather around and join us for the children's message. So here we hear once again from Zach and Xander. Good morning, Faith family. Thank you, Pastor Scott. So this morning, we're going to talk about celebration. There are a lot of things that people celebrate, like birthdays and anniversaries and holidays like Memorial Day. But people also celebrate little things like winning a game or a contest. So my friend Zeb, he has a question for you right now. Hi Faith Kids, what makes you smile? Holidays and birthdays. Playing games and sports with my family. Thanks, Nani, Loki, Remy, and Sunny for your answers. Some of our friends also answered on Facebook. Hannah said that what makes her smile is when her family acts silly. And David said the Zeb makes him smile. Aw, thanks. And thank you all for your answers. You know what makes me smile? You make me smile. But sometimes, sadly, things come along that take away our smile and turn our celebration into a pity party. You know what I'm talking about. Like when things don't go your way, when you lose the game instead of winning it, like when you get picked on. Well, Peter talked about getting picked on. He was talking to some Christians who were getting picked on just because they believe in Jesus. That's so not fair, right? Well, anyway, what he said was kind of upside down and backwards because he said that when you get picked on for believing in Jesus, it's a reason to smile because then people know that you believe in Jesus. And also, he reminded them that Jesus was picked on. And I know you know the story. Jesus suffered, he was crucified, and then he died on the cross. But you also know that he rose again from the dead. And because of that, believers, you and me, we believe that because Jesus rose from the dead, we will rise from the dead too. And that definitely brings a smile on my face. That's good. You know what? I think if we were to ask Jesus what makes him smile, I think he would say the same thing I did. You, you make Jesus smile. He loves you that much. Now I have a question for you. Can you add 
getting picked on because you believe in Jesus to your list of the things that make you smile? Maybe, I hope so. But whether you do or not, right now, let's bring that, let's talk to Jesus about that. So let's join our hearts and our minds as we pray to Jesus. Dear Jesus, thank you for suffering for me. Will you please help me to trust in you and be able to smile even when I get picked on for believing in you? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. God bless. Well, welcome back. Thank you so much, Zach and Xander, for that wonderful message. We hear from St. Peter in 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. I invite you now to join me in, in watching this uh, a little bit of an intro here from Simon and Zeke. Hey Zeke, how's it going? Looks like you're doing okay uh, despite all the corona craziness. Yeah, still a little anxious to be back here at the office, but praise God everyone's doing good and is healthy, so. Yeah, and uh, we can get toilet paper again. <laughs> yeah, amen to that. Yeah, you know, uh, speaking of uh, amen and all of that, uh, I'm going to church again. Hey, that's great, Simon. Yeah, uh, well, I guess technically I haven't been going to church. Uh, I just saw it online. You know, my wife, uh, she asked me to, to watch it, and uh, I didn't have a real excuse, did I? So, uh, you know, I sat there on the couch in my bathrobe and watched it on the on the Internet. I uh, had my cake and ate it, too. Yeah, being in a church building can be a great experience, but during these times, the virtual option is a good second. How was your worship? Well, you know, Zeke, our pastor was preaching pretty heavily on Christian suffering. You know, it was like all the hymns were dirges. I mean, it was one. It kind of goes with the season. Yeah, but, you know, even after Easter, he was still talking a lot about uh, suffering. And, you know, it just doesn't seem like a very good way to sell your religion. I mean, we hear enough about crisis and trouble in the world. I don't want to hear about it in church, too. I mean, especially with all this COVID stuff going on. Well, first of all, nobody's trying to sell anything to anyone. God's word is just there to tell us the truth about everything. It doesn't sugarcoat anything like our sin and its effects on this world. I mean, do you think if we don't talk about the pain and suffering of this life, it'll just go away? No, of course not. It's just that, you know, I want my worship to be uplifting. I mean, I want to walk away from church feeling uplifted and start the week off in a positive, fulfilled note, not thinking about suffering. But Simon, there is good news in the service. The gospel, it tells us that even amid trouble, Jesus is there with us, even during terrible sufferings. He's right there, and he knows what we're experiencing, because he suffered worse than we can ever imagine when he died for us on the cross. Yeah. You got a good point there. And not just that, but he overcame it. Not just the suffering, too. He defeated death. Because he rose, we know that one day the suffering in this life will come to an end. And we have a brilliant and eternal future ahead of us because he suffered, died, and rose for us. You know, he says, in this world, you'll face troubles. But take heart, I overcame the world. Dude. You are scary. <laughs> what? How? No, you're just so wise for somebody your age. Your parents must be really proud. Oh, thank you. But I can't take credit. The wisdom's not from me. It's from Jesus. And I just want to share the peace that he's given to me with others. Because maybe if they knew that there was hope beyond this life, you know, they'd feel that, like they had a little more optimism. They were a little more fulfilled. And maybe, just maybe, they'd be a little more loving to one another. 
Yeah, and maybe they wouldn't hoard the toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of suffering, I better get back to work. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Zeke. This has really meant a bunch to me, and, and I really appreciate it. I learned so much from you. Oh, and hey, by the way, just in case. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. You know, I must admit that there are times when I agree with Simon, that there are certain things about Christianity that, using Simon's words, can make it difficult to sell to others. Because by all human reasoning, this faith of ours should have died out long, long ago. That it has somehow managed to survive for 2,000 years just doesn't make sense. Because you see, from a worldly perspective, there's much about our faith that doesn't make sense. Indeed, the major tenets of Christianity are in direct conflict with human thought, reason, and desires. Our faith tells us that we, at our core, are not basically good. On the contrary, it states that we are, because of our fallen nature, basically sinful creatures who deserve nothing but death and damnation. And that flies in the face of humanism and almost every other worldly belief. Our faith tells us that there are not many roads to heaven, that there is one God who has revealed himself in his unerrant word and his son, Jesus Christ, and that Jesus is the only way of salvation. But the world will tell you that that thinking is too exclusive, that it's unfairly judging others, those of different beliefs. After all, the world says, it isn't what you believe, but how sincerely you believe it. In fact, much of what Jesus himself says can be a little hard to swallow. He doesn't tell us that following him will be easy, that it will lead to happiness in this life. He doesn't preach a gospel of prosperity as many other religions, and indeed, even as some so-called and very popular Christian televangelists espouse. In fact, Jesus told his disciples just the opposite, that the world would hate them because of him. He told them that they must take up their cross and follow him. And then he himself, the one in whom they had been waiting for millennia, the one in whom they were to place all of their hope above all others, he himself was arrested, paraded through the streets like a common criminal, and hung on a cross to die. Very soon, his followers began to die too. Most of the disciples suffered horrible deaths because they followed him. Those who dared call themselves Christians were persecuted. Some were stoned. Some were put in the arena to be torn apart by wild beasts. Others were hung on crosses and set on fire to light the streets of Rome. And here is Peter the disciple-in-chief, telling those very people that they should not be surprised at such suffering, but they should rejoice in it. Rejoice in it. Really? And they bought that? It doesn't make sense. That message wasn't just for the people of that day. No, folks, that message is for me and you as well. Because the persecution hasn't stopped. 
disciples of Jesus are suffering and dying today simply because they follow him. And you, all of you, are looked at as being naive, judgmental, hypocritical, fanatical, or just plain stupid. And sometimes it's all of the above. That people would want to bring any of those things upon themselves by following Jesus just doesn't make sense. It defies all logic. This faith of ours should have died out before the end of the first century when being baptized as a Christian was tantamount to signing your own death warrant. And yet, here we are nonetheless, worshiping a man who was horribly executed, a man whose followers were horribly executed, practicing a faith that promises us no honor or material gain in this life, a faith that in fact guarantees us some level of suffering simply because we worship Jesus as God and Christ. So I have to ask you, why? Why? Wouldn't it be so much easier just to roll with the flow and march in step with the rest of the world? Well, as you know, there's a great deal more to our faith than all of that, isn't there? Yes, despite all of the miracles that Jesus performed, Despite all of the wonderful things he said, including his admonition to love one another and his promise to forgive our sins, despite all of that, our faith would have died along with Jesus if he had never come out of that tomb. And I guarantee you that none of the disciples would have suffered as they did if they knew that Jesus was still in his grave. The Gospels never would have been written. St. Paul never would have been converted. The folks of Asia Minor, Macedonia, and Greece, and in Rome would have been content to remain in their pagan beliefs. And so would we. But friends, I am here to tell you today that there is nothing more certain in this life than that Jesus really did walk out of that tomb. There is nothing more true, more certain, than that he is alive right now, and that all of his promises are true. The disciples knew it. As the Apostle John tells us in his first epistle, they saw Jesus in the flesh. They touched Jesus after he had risen from the grave. And Peter also tells us that we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We have their testimony, and it's recorded right here in Scripture. Now, considering these things. Two things are immediately evident to me. First, if it wasn't true that Jesus rose from the dead, others would certainly have written denying the apostles' claims. Someone would have come forward. In fact, the Jewish authorities would have hauled in the disciples and demanded to know what they had done with the body. And they never would have stopped searching until they found it. But they didn't. Their first reaction was to pay off the soldiers who had been guarding the tomb. Those men who had passed out at the very moment of the resurrection. Ordering them. They ordered them to tell the people that the disciples had snatched the body of Jesus during the night. And the second and more weighty argument is this. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, the disciples would surely have known it. 
They would have known the truth if they had not seen him and touched him. They would have absolutely known that he was still in his grave. And they certainly wouldn't have suffered as they did for what they would have known to be a lie. And yes, people who have been deceived will die for their belief. That happens all the time. But would the fabricators of that lie willingly suffer for it? I think not. And they certainly wouldn't have permitted themselves to be tortured to death for it either. Why would they? The disciples had nothing earthly to gain in preaching about Jesus and his resurrection. They weren't after power. They weren't after wealth. They were only after spreading the word of forgiveness and eternal life in the crucified, resurrection, and living and risen Lord Jesus. And they were willing to risk everything in order to do that. You know, it reminds me of the wise words of one of the Jewish Pharisees. You might recall the account in Acts chapter 5 when the authorities hauled in the disciples and ordered them to stop preaching this name of Jesus. And Gamaliel, the the very Pharisee who taught St. Paul, stood up and advised that they leave the disciples alone. For he said, if their preaching were of men, it would come to nothing. But if it was of God, nothing could stop it. And nothing has stopped it to this day. The good news that our sins were forgiven the moment Jesus died on the cross and our eternal life guaranteed when he rose from the dead is still being proclaimed today, over 2,000 years later. And that news has shaken the world and is even now transforming the world as surely as the earth itself shook when Jesus walked out of that grave. That truth, that Jesus is risen, that he is alive, and that he is Lord of all, transformed the disciples from a handful of cowering sheep into bold witnesses who were willing to risk all, to suffer all for the sake of Jesus, who gave them everything. They knew the truth and willingly suffered for it because they had seen the resurrected Christ. And they knew that his promises were real. That fact transformed their lives and it's transformed our lives too. Friends, we have in Jesus a joy that surpasses anything this world can give. We trust his word and his promises and the testimony of those who knew him because it guarantees us a future greater than we could ever imagine and an inheritance more valuable than anything money could buy. We have right Now, the promise that death is not the end. The hope that we will one day live in a recreated world without suffering or death or pain of any kind. And we trust God's word because it has never been proven wrong. Because God has delivered on every one of his promises and and he always will. It's our anchor in every storm of life. It's the hope to which we cling no matter what suffering this life may bring. No, to those who are blinded by the world, our faith may not make sense. They can ridicule it. They can can mock us and berate us. They can even put us to death. But they can't stop the power of the gospel, and the eternal life it brings. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We now pause to give glory to God by 
uh, giving our offerings, returning to him a very small portion of the blessings that he gives us. Of course, we do so remotely. As we do that, though, uh, uh, I'd like to, um, for you to stop and watch our Ministry Minute video here. Uh, today, we are remembering all of our, those uh, high school seniors and college seniors who are graduating. And we especially want to uh, honor and bless them today since they won't be doing so in person. They'll have to get their diplomas uh, remotely and have their, their graduation ceremony remotely. So uh, here they are. Here's all of the names of, of those that are graduating. Uh, and if you see them or if you have occasion to talk to them, uh, make sure that you uh, remind them that that you are praying for them as we all are as well. Christ is our cornerstone On him alone we build With his true saints alone the courts of heaven are filled On His great love Our hopes we place of present grace And joys above Here may we gain from heaven The grace which we implore May that grace once given be with us evermore Until that day When all the blessed to endless rest are called away Oh, then the hymns of praise Christ is our cornerstone, on him alone we build. With his true saints alone, the courts of heaven are filled. On his great love, our hopes we place of present grace and joy.
I invite you now to stand and join me uh, together in the prayers of the church. Blessed Jesus, risen and ascended Lord, we give thanks for all those saints who have suffered before us to share the good news of salvation in you. Strengthen our faith that even though we may suffer in this life, we may share the joy we have of our eternal salvation in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Jesus, giver of mercy and peace, strengthen your church as she labors to broadcast your love to the world. Especially guard, keep, and protect those who are actively working in the mission field, especially those in South Africa, Ethiopia, Turkey, Guatemala, the Franklin Avenue Mission in Flint, and the greater Grand Blanc Outreach that your Holy Spirit would speak through them to bring more sheep into your fold of peace and grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray your guidance and direction for every congregation that is now struggling with the decisions about returning to regular worship, that the decisions they make may be considerate of our weaker brothers and sisters, those who are in fear of the virus for reasons of health or other considerations, as well as those who are eager to move on, that all may be done for the good of the whole. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father and giver of all good things, you bless us with the provisions we need in this life, including the governments and leaders you provide that we may live and worship you in peace. Uh, bless especially President Trump, Governor Whitmer, and all who make and judge our laws. Bless those who serve in our local communities, that their leadership and direction would help to ensure our safety and peace. And we particularly ask your guidance as they handle the issues involving our health during this current emergency. Bless also those who are active on active military duty, especially Anthony Bryant Ott and Noah Hall that they may discharge their duties with integrity and keep them safe from harm, Lord. Bless also uh, all medical personnel, first responders, including police, fire, and EMS workers, as they risk their own safety to keep your people safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Jesus, great physician, we pray for physical healing and comfort for those who are ill. Especially today, we lift up John Cokey, for healing of his esophageal issues, for Dee Carlson for the heart issues that she's dealing with, for Deborah Looney recovering from pneumonia, and for Bob Rainey, father of Mary Schember, suffering from pancreatic cancer, and for those we name silently in our hearts. Lord, we know that there are others who are suffering in mind, body, and soul. And we pray that you and your mercy would give each all uh, that is needed to make them well and comfort them with your enduring peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have said that it is not good for the man to be alone. Therefore, you provided a mate for him and established the institution of marriage as, as men and women united in you. And this week, we especially ask your blessing upon uh, Matthew Nihans and Hannah Bierman as they are joined together as husband and wife, that they may continue to grow in love towards you and for one another all throughout their, their years ahead. And bless them in every way according to your gracious will. We also lift up Ray and Cindy Zavada celebrating 46 years as husband and wife, that they may share many more joyful years together and ever be an expression of your love for us. Lord, in your mercy hear our prayer. Blessed Jesus, we also ask a special blessing upon those young people graduating from high school and college, that as they continue with their lives, they may grow ever closer to you and shine your light of love and mercy in all they do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For these and all other things, we rejoice, Lord, that you are ever with us, that you have given your holy angels to watch over us, and that you hear and answer our every prayer with uh, our best interests in mind. And we ask all of this in the name of your risen and resurrected Lord Jesus, who reigns forever with you and with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we pray together that prayer 
our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the glory, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. And I ask that you join me now for our closing hymn. Uh, a hymn of glory, let us sing, which is the, the final verse of the first hymn we sung, uh, number 493 in the hymnal. In Christ ascended Lord, all praise to you that earth accord. Alleluia, alleluia. You are wild, endless ages run with Father and with Spirit one. Alleluia, alleluia. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Go in peace, knowing that while Christianity may, may, might not make sense to the world, Jesus is risen, and all of his promises are true. Amen.